Thank you for joining us today on the test bench. Today we're turning this into this. We have the components here to make a computer with an Intel G4560. 8 gigabytes of Patriot Signature 2400 megahertz RAM and a PNY GTX 1050 video card. This will all be mounted on ASUS H110M-E motherboard and powered by an EVGA 400 watt power supply, all contained in an EVGA DG73 case. Try saying that 10 times fast. The reason for this tutorial today is if you're on an extreme budget and you want to build an Intel computer, this is the kind of computer you're going to put together. The parts in it cost roughly $567 full retail, but they go on special all the time. We put this together, including Windows, for about $447. If you can get a steal on the graphics card, you could probably do it for closer to $400. On a philosophical level, I've named every computer I've ever built. The ones on this channel aren't going to be an exception. This is a broadsword. So, let's begin. The first step to building a computer is pretty obvious. Opening the case. Most cases of thumb screws in the back holding slide off side panels in place. Consult your case's manual for exact instructions. Regardless of how your case comes apart, you'll want to make sure you don't lose those screws. I recommend putting any screws you remove from the case and any screws you're going to use to mount parts into a magnetic parts tray so you don't lose track of them. Now, place the case on its side and install the rear I.O. shield into the large rectangular opening in the back of the case. These come packaged with the motherboard and are specific to that motherboard. Also, the cheaper the motherboard, the flimsier and more difficult these are to install. Next, we install the motherboard standoffs, whose purpose is to raise the motherboard from the metal case to prevent it from shorting. You'll notice holes in your motherboard that should line up with the pattern of standoff holes in the case. These are the holes you want to install the standoffs in. This case has a permanent standoff in the middle right, as all ATX and MATX motherboards will be guaranteed to have a standoff hole there. Our next step is to lower the board into the case, being sure to line up the I.O. ports on the back with the openings in the I.O. shield. You'll want to snug the board up against the I.O. shield to ensure the standoff holes on the motherboard line up with the standoffs. Here's where you consult your case manual again. Some of the screws that came with it are specifically for fixing the motherboard to the standoffs. I like to screw in the one closest to the I.O. shield first, followed by the one diagonal from it, as having the opposing corners screwed in will ensure the rest of the screw holes line up properly. While touching the components that go inside of the case, it's important that you're free of static electricity as discharging into a component could fry the circuitry. If you live in an extremely dry climate and often get shocked when touching light switches, I would recommend using an ESD wrist strap. Otherwise, touching the metal frame of the case prior to picking up a component should keep you grounded. Next, we install the CPU. You open the socket cover by pushing down on the retention arm and then sliding it to the side to free the hook. Then pull back on the retention arm to raise the mechanism. Now remove the plastic shield. It's there to protect the socket when the processor isn't mounted. Be sure to keep the processor and its packaging right up until when you install it. For most Intel CPUs, the socket on the motherboard will contain pins and the bottom of the processor has pads. Do not touch the underside of the CPU and do not bend any pins. Both Intel and AMD processors have a symbol in the bottom left corner. The same symbol will be seen on the CPU socket on the motherboard. You'll want to make sure that when you install the processor, you orient it so those symbols line up. Once the CPU is in the socket, lower the locking mechanism by putting the pincers underneath the screw, then lower the retention arm and hook it back in. The RAM is next. 
The slot is bifurcated, with the lower section being shorter than the top section. Ensure your ram stick is oriented correctly before installing. Open the clip on the socket, and then push it straight down in with even pressure. Then press down on the lower half of the ram stick until you hear a click, then press down on the top half of the ram until you hear a click and the clip locks into place. If the clip doesn't click into place by itself, you haven't seated the memory module completely. Now we install the CPU cooler. We're using the stock cooler that came with the processor as it should be more than enough. It has pre-applied thermal paste. Several aftermarket coolers don't, however. For the Intel stock cooler, all you need to do is place it over the CPU, ensure the prongs on the bottom match with the holes around the socket, then use the mechanism on top of the prongs to push them through the hole to lock it in place. There is going to be a fan header on the motherboard specifically for the CPU cooler. You will want to use that to power the fan. I also had an issue with the wires on mine being in the way of the fan blades. If you encounter that, you'll want to gently work the wires out of the clips they're in so the fan doesn't dice its own wires while operating. Every step after this is going to involve plugging in power cables, so let's install our power supply unit next. The DG73 has a back plate you screw into the power supply, which allows you to slide it through the rear of the case and then screw the plate into the case. Every case is going to handle this slightly differently, so consult your manual. Hard drive mounting is the next step, and is highly affected by whatever mechanism your case uses. The DG73 uses mounted plates on the back side of the case. It will be installing an SSD to run Windows off of, and a regular hard drive for data. Next, we'll connect the SATA data cables to the drives, and then feed them through the case to the side the motherboard is on. I realized I goofed up, and with the way this case was designed, I had to angle the hard drive to connect the cable. When installing the cable, keep in mind the plug is shaped like an L and can only connect one way. Typically, the short leg of the L is pointing at the bottom of the drive. Next, we want to organize our power cables. First, we want to take our 4-pin connector that connects to the top of the motherboard and feed it through the hole for this purpose at the top of the motherboard tray. The only other cables we're going to use are the two SATA power for the drives and the 24-pin power connector for the motherboard. We want to take the rest and bundle them with a twist tie. The packaging for our components have plenty to choose from. Then tuck those away. This is also a good time to take the 24-pin connector and run it through the opening between the motherboard tray and the front of the system. Now we connect the SATA power cables. Just like with the SATA data cables, the connections are L-shaped, and the short leg points to the bottom of the drive. Next, we plug the cables into the motherboard. Your 4-pin connector plugs in here, at the top of the motherboard. Your 24-pin connector goes into the giant socket on the side. Your SATA cables go into SATA ports. However, look at how they're labeled on your motherboard. SATA 6GB and SATA 3GB are different speeds, with the 6 gigabyte being faster, just how it sounds. Always plug an SSD into a 6 gigabyte port if you can. These connectors at the bottom are for HD audio, USB, lights, and the power buttons on your case. Always refer to the manual for the motherboard so you know where these go. The most common reason a computer won't start up after it's built is the power wire is connected to the wrong pins, so always double check. Now we need to open up two expansion slots and the retention panel so we can get the graphics card in. You're only going to find retention panels blocking access to the expansion slot brackets on cases that let you vertically mount your graphics card. After that, we're ready to install the graphics card into the PCIe slot. You'll want to open the clip on the back of the slot and firmly seat the card in the socket. The clip will snap into place the same way the RAM clips do. 
and you'll want to make sure the metal on the rear bracket is pressed against the expansion slot area. Now, replace the retention bracket if your case requires that. Then use the screws that were holding the slot covers in place to fix the card bracket to the case. It's not strictly necessary, but we'll make sure the card is seated well and we'll take pressure off the slot mounted to the motherboard in the case of heavier cards. Our case is going to need at least two fans aside from the CPU cooler fan, but our motherboard only has one PWM fan header. This deep cool fan hub has an adhesive backing so we can stick it to the case, then wrap the cable around the back of the motherboard tray. We can then route it through the same hole we use for the four pin power connector and connect it to the fan header. Next, we want to install the rear fan. When you install a fan, the side with the cross piece on the frame is the side air comes out of, and the opposite side is where the air is drawn in. So, we're installing this fan to exhaust hot air. Also, I always recommend using four pin fans and motherboards that support them. A four pin fan works off something called pulse width modulation, or PWM, which allows the computer to adjust the speed of the fan, and thus the noise depending on how hot the system is running. You'll notice I also ran the cables for the fans behind the motherboard tray so they could loop back around to the fan hub with minimal wires being visible from the side of the motherboard. It is at this point the computer is mechanically sound and could be fired up, but we're going to tidy things up a bit with some cable management. This will make the computer look cleaner, make it more organized if you need to perform maintenance, promote better airflow, and besides, you sunk your hard-earned money into this thing, and finishing it off like this will demonstrate the pride you have in building it. To begin the cable management process, you want to push as much visible cable as possible behind the case, but be careful not to draw them too tight in the process, or you may damage them. Feel free to use twist ties to bundle wires together, and we should end up with something that looks a lot like this and bundle the cables together so they create paths. Don't force them into ways they don't want to bend, but guide them in a way they naturally want to go. Use twist ties to affix them to the case. Most cases have holes in the chassis specifically for this. The power cables on the PSU tend to stay where you put them, so you let those rest how they wanted to naturally after moving them into position. Now all you have to do is put the side panels back on, plug in your peripherals, and fire it up. Congratulations, you've just built your first computer. Join us next time on the test bench when we show you how to install Windows and other software. After that, we benchmark Broadsword and Doom, Overwatch, Grand Theft Auto 5, and Fallout 4 among others, and see what this baby can do. Like this video and subscribe to the Test Bench. Feel free to join us on Facebook. Back us on Patreon if you want to help us show you more cool stuff. And follow us on Twitter. You'll find clickable links in the description. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out our other videos.